So welcome to Wild Sarasota, Other Raptors of Florida. I am Dr. Katherine Clemens, the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. In my position here for the Extension Office in our county, I provide education for youth and adults and assist our community with pretty much anything having to do with wildlife as well as native and invasive species that can be plant or animals. I also do talks and walks about the health benefits of nature. I just did a meditation walk this morning at Redbug Slough here in Sarasota County. It's a beautiful day today. And then I do other walks that are more like guided interpretive walks where I spend two hours with groups out on our county park and preserve lands and just talk about the ecosystems and uh, the plants and animals that live here in our unique ecosystems in Sarasota County and in Florida. And so those are called eco walks and you can register for those. We do a couple of them a month. So they're really wonderful to come out and just spend some time outdoors learning a little bit about nature. I have a bachelor's degree in environmental studies from where I'm originally from, which is Buffalo. So uh, that lovely person who's joining us from Canada, I totally understand the cold weather and the snow. In fact, I think the day of my last presentation, uh, Buffalo was getting, that was that day, Buffalo was getting like seven feet of snow in 24 hours or something crazy like that, or four feet whatever it was, it was crazy. Um, so that's where I'm originally from. And I did my undergrad there. I worked in environmental and outdoor education and then decided to uh, become a physician and traveled out to Seattle to do my medical training out there and came back to Florida to do my residency and practice for a number of years. About six years ago, I came back into environmental education by taking this position here at the County Extension Office. I've also lived for almost two decades in a state park with my husband and the rest of our family. So even when I was working out of an office, I got to go home to nature, which was fabulous little bit about our extension offices. We are partnerships between the county we're in, the land grant university in that state. In this case, it's University of Florida. And we also have FAMU up in Tallahassee and the USDA. And our mission is to take the research and resources of the university and share them with our local communities in a way that helps provide opportunities, education, and solutions for issues within that county. So Sarasota County, if you're coming in from somewhere else, we are a county that's very urban and still has rural and agricultural lands, and we're a coastal county. So we have lots of different things going on in Sarasota County. It's really a beautiful place. And therefore, our extension office has programming in all sorts of different areas that you see here on your screen. So you can reach out to us um, for help with any of these uh, areas or to take classes in any of these topics. So please feel free to take a look at our class schedule and sign up for some other things or drop by at our office if you need to ask a question. Here are just some of the logos of some of our main programs up there in the upper right hand corner is the Florida Master Naturalist Program, which I'm a lead instructor and advisory board member of. It's, it's just actually the reason I changed my career back to environmental education. It's an amazing program. I know we have some master naturalist students uh, that have taken classes from me on the call today, and it is just a great course to take if you're interested in learning more about our Florida ecosystems and getting some behind the scenes field trips in as well. And we do have one coming up, uh, which I have on the end slide at the end of the presentation, but we do have a freshwater master naturalist class that's starting, I believe, January 24th. And that's a 40 hour class. So we teach it over six to seven days. All right, so let's jump into our topic of the day. So let's talk about general things about raptors first. So you've seen this slide in some of my other raptor presentations. So a raptor is basically a bird of prey. It's going to be a carnivorous bird that eats other animals. And they have specific adaptations that allow them to survive and eat the food they eat. They have eight sharp talons, so four on each feet. Their feet are generally very strong. And raptor is Latin for to grasp or seize, which is what they use the talons and their feet to do. 
Uh, they also have a hooked, strong upper beak, like we're seeing in some of these pictures that helps them dismantle their prey. Most raptors have well-developed eyes. Uh, so most raptors really utilize their sight to hunt their prey. Their eyes take up a large portion of their skull, which is always indicative of that sense being really important to that particular animal or species. Their sight can be eight to 10 times better than humans. And they also have this cool thing where they have a third eyelid besides their upper and lower eyelids. They have a nictitating membrane, which is like a clear eyelid that can go over their eyes um, to clean them or to protect them. And raptors provide important ecosystem services because they are a predator. They help maintain ecosystem balance and eat some of those sort of middle of the food chain type animals or um, insects so that we are not overrun by things like insects and rodents and rabbits and things like that. They also are an indicator of environmental health. So many of our raptors sort of went through the story that I tell in the bald eagle presentation about DVT, uh, which was a chemical that we used in this country into the early 1970s. Uh, but in the 1960s, we realized that it was really impacting uh, many of our raptor species that were eating fish, especially that were in waters contaminated with DDT. And that was being biomagnified or increased up through the food chain until the raptors had enough of the DDT in their bodies that it actually impacted how calcium was deposited into their eggshells so that their eggshells were very brittle and often broke before the babies were hatched. And so, um, or the DDT just outright made the animals, the adult animals sick. So um, with the removal of DDT, we saw a rebound of some of our raptor populations that were impacted by that. So that's just one example. Lead is another example uh, that causes issues in birds that eat other birds that may have lead shot in them from being shot. All right, so here's just a laundry list of raptors that we can find in North America. Uh, so lots of different species of raptors. They're just really amazing, beautiful, specifically adapted birds. Uh, I just think they are phenomenal. So I love getting the opportunity to learn more about them by talking about them to all of you. Today, we're gonna to focus on a certain group of raptors. And this is, this is a phylogenic tree showing how the raptors are related to each other. And then I've also placed circles in here um, that indicate the actual presentations that I've done. I believe this is gonna be my last raptor presentation. So I have a hawk webinar that I've done that encompasses all the species that are in this oval here. And of course, uh, because I work in Florida, I really mostly focus just on species that are found in Florida. So there are obviously other raptors throughout North America, but we're really just focusing on the ones that are found in Florida, but they may also be found in other parts of the country as well. So we have a hawk webinar focusing on these species. Uh, the eagles get their very own webinar that mostly is focused on the story of the bald eagle because golden eagles just are very rarely here, um, just very occasionally can be found in North Florida. So that's mostly a webinar about bald eagles. Today, we're going to cover the kites, which are in the same family that the hawks and the eagles are in. So we're going to talk about four different species of kites that can be found in Florida today. We're also going to talk about the osprey, a very sort of iconic Florida bird. And I'm going to jump to the bottom of this slide. We're also going to talk about turkey vultures and black vultures because I haven't talked about them yet. Uh, my other webinars, I have an owl webinar that talks about these four species of owls that are found here in Florida. And then we also have a falcon webinar that talks about these four species of falcons, including the caracara. I think we just did that one last month. So most of these are available for viewing on YouTube, and I will tell you at the end of the webinar how to get to them. All right, so let's jump into the raptors that we're going to cover today. So let's first talk about ospreys. Once again, very iconic common bird to see here in Florida, especially if 
you are in a coastal uh, county here in Florida, they are large raptors with slender bodies and long narrow wings like you can see here in this photo. They're mostly brown above and mostly white when you see them from below. So here we're seeing a couple in flight. So we're seeing them from below and you can see they have quite a bit of white on their bodies and on their, um, their wrists and shoulders. So this is their wrist and this is their shoulder. Sorry, backwards. This is their shoulder, this is their wrist. Um, so they have a lot of white, especially on the shoulder and just going into the wrist. And then you see their tail feathers and their flight feathers are barred black and white feathers with some, uh, or brown and white with some brown tipping on the end of those primary flight feathers. Uh, the head is also white. And, you know, it's really interesting. I find that people often confuse ospreys with bald eagles, especially when they're seen from a distance flying, because they do have that white head. And we, we are often programmed to get really excited when we see a large bird with a white head and we think we're seeing a bald eagle. Here in Sarasota County, we see both. We see bald eagles and ospreys. Ospreys are large. They're not as large as a bald eagle, but they are. They can easily be mistaken, especially from a distance and in flight. One of the characteristics um, is that, of course, a bald eagle's body is going to be brown, whereas our osprey's body is white. And although they both have a white head, you see here that the osprey will have a brown streak basically going from its beak um, through its eye back to its neck. So uh, that would be an identifying feature and you can really see it in the photo here. And I have, I have some other photos coming to show you. Uh, ospreys have an yellow eye. And then our juvenile ospreys have white spots on their back and sort of a buff shading on their chest. So a little bit more variation in color. Uh, and we also often call ospreys fish hawks, which is just confusing. They look a little bit like bald eagles. We call them fish hawks, but they really are ospreys. And here you can once again really see, when you see a closer up photo, you can really see that black streak um, through the eye into the neck area that is going to set a white head up apart from the bald eagle's head. You see how white the undersides of their body are. And then the upper um, parts of their wings when seen from above are going to be brown. Whereas when they're seen from underneath, they're a little bit more barred brown and white. So they will build large stick nests that commonly are found on top of lake poles, dead trees. Here, this is one that was found on a channel marker. So I was out in the intercoastal waterway um, between Sarasota and Venice and took some of the pictures that you're seeing. I think all the pictures in this presentation on the, on the ospreys are pictures that I took in the intercoastal. Uh, so this is a very typical nest. Uh, it's one of the reasons why sometimes you'll see uh, wires sticking up from some of the taller light posts or other places where ospreys might build a nest to try to keep them from building nests there, especially if it's not safe or going to do damage to some type of man-made structure. But you'll also see man-made platforms um, placed out. Like if you ever go down south and go across the rebuilt causeway to Sanibel. I'm sure most of the nests were destroyed this year by the hurricane, but previous to Hurricane Ian, the causeway going to Sanibel was lined with platforms where there was almost an osprey nest on every single platform as you drove along that bridge. Um, they're found throughout North America, but they are year-round residents only in the Southeast and certainly very common here in Florida. Uh, they must be within about 12 miles of a body of water that will provide them with their food supply, which is exclusively fish that they catch when diving into shallow water. So they can only dive up to about three feet. So they're not going to be seen diving um, in really deep water, they're going to prefer to dive in shallow water, or if the water gets deeper, not to dive very far into it. 
Um, they consistently catch fish in one out of every four of their dives, which I actually think is pretty amazing because I would think it would be difficult to see a fish from up high and dive and be accurate before that fish moves. Um, so they consistently are successful 25% of their dives with success rates as high as 70% per dive. And they take about 12 minutes to actually catch a fish when they go out hunting. So it doesn't take them very long. They're pretty successful at their jobs of catching fish. And some fun facts about osprey, they may log 160,000 or more miles in their 15 to 20 year lifespan. Uh, especially when we're talking about the migrating ones, not the year round ones. In 2008, an osprey was trapped going from Massachusetts to South America into French Guiana. And they that osprey flew 2,700 miles in 13 days. So that's just a lot of traveling in a short period of time. And uh, for the ospreys that are not in the Southeast, they're going to make that migration um, multiple times, obviously, throughout their lifespan. They also have a reversible outer toe. We sometimes call that zygodactyl toes. So usually um, we'll have three toes that point forward with one toe behind, but some of our raptors will have a zygodactyl toe like owls do as well, that allow them to take that outer toe and move it behind in order to grasp well. And so uh, this is a, a adaptation that allows them to be more successful in catching food. And um, they also have a very interesting texture on their feet that allows them to hold on to those slippery fish. They also will orient the, orientate the fish head first so that as the osprey is flying, the fish is lengthwise um, parallel with that osprey's body to help decrease wind resistance in flight. Pretty amazing. So here's another picture. This was out on a pole out in the water in the intercoastal. Uh, just beautiful um, picture of this bird. You can really see the yellow eye. You can see that brown streak through that white feathered head. Um, the brown upper wings and the white underbelly. And look at those talons holding on. So here's the three talons that can be forward facing with the one backward facing talon, but this talon here, the outermost talon can actually move and face backwards. It's almost like it's almost opposable. Uh, once again, a picture in the intercoastal waterway, or perhaps this was Sarasota Bay. So here's a mangrove in shallow water, one of our red mangroves, and you can see the osprey nest and the osprey coming in to land in that nest. And here's another example of a nest in a dead tree. My guess would be this is a dead pine tree, and we've got a pair of osprey nesting up there in that tree. All right, so now we're gonna talk about vultures. We have two species of vultures here in Florida. We have the black vulture and the turkey vulture. So let's talk about the black vulture first. This is a photo from University of Florida IFAS. Uh, I'm not sure what they were doing here, but they must've been involved in some sort of research with the black vultures. And so black vultures are a, a large raptor with a broad rounded wings and a short rounded tail. They fly with strong wing beats and short glides, and you often see both black and turkey vultures, as well as hawks, soaring on thermals, um, which are just wind currents created in the air based on the temperature of the air. And so they will just catch one of those thermals and glide and sort of um, soar in circles. And we sometimes call that a kettle when there's a group of birds soaring on those thermals. So aside from the silvery patches that you can see on the underside of the wings, and I'm going to show you some close-up pictures of the feathers in just a minute, the black vulture is entirely black. So like we see here, all of the feathers are black, except we'll see on the underside of the wings, there's a little bit of silvery gray. 
Um, also their primary um, first uh, flight feathers actually spread apart, then they look a little bit like fingers when they're in flight. Black vultures like forested and open areas in the Eastern and Southern United States, as well as they can be found in South America. They're gonna breed in forests, so they like to be away from people when they breed, but they will forage in open areas and along roadsides when they're looking for food. So there's another close up of the vulture eating a little bit of something and it's um, strong curved or hooked beak really see the blackness of its feathers. And of course it has a naked unfeathered skin on its head and also on its feet. So if you are a, rap, a raptor that is a vulture and you're eating carrion, which is dead meat, you certainly um, benefit from having no feathers on your head or legs because it's much easier to keep yourself clean and not have rotting flesh sticking to those feathers as you're eating. Um, so their diet is almost exclusively dead animal carcasses, although they have been known to search shallow water for floating dead things like fish, for instance, and they certainly will go to dumpsters for discarded food. They occasionally, rarely will kill small mammals and turtles, but they're mostly looking for something that's already dead. And in comparison to turkey vultures, which we'll talk about next, black vultures do not have an advanced sense of smell. So they see better than they smell, which is opposite for the turkey vulture. So black vultures will often soar higher in the sky than turkey vultures, and they will keep an eye eye on turkey vultures and let the turkey vultures smell out their next meal. Another fun fact is that um, black vultures lack a voice box, so they have limited vocal abilities and basically just hiss and grunt. And I found this also very interesting. They're very loyal to their family. They're monogamous during breeding season. And then they are known to share food with relatives or feed their young for months. So they will feed their young vultures for upwards of eight months after the young hatch, which is um, unusual for many of our bird species. Here's another close up picture of a black vulture. These are some of my pictures now. And these were, I believe these are all gonna be pictures that were taken at Mayaka River State Park. So. Vultures are pretty common at Mayaka. I would say that I mostly see black vultures when I'm there, but certainly there are turkey vultures too. Uh, black vultures tend to be a little bit common, but I see both of them here in Sarasota County. I was just at Redbug Slough this morning, as I mentioned, and I saw only turkey vultures soaring in the sky. So um, they're definitely both here and will intermix. So this is out at Deep Hole in Mayaka River State Park. If any of you have ever been there, it's a really wonderful walk. Um, there is a quota, so you're, they only allow a very few number of people out each day. You have to get to the ranger station in the morning. But I believe it's a couple mile hike out to Deep Hole, which is um, exactly what it sounds like a deep hole where water has filled in from the river and it stays wet even during dry season. And as you can see in the background of the picture on your left, uh, the alligators will congregate at deep hole, especially in dry season when other parts of the river are drying up. And there can be hundreds of alligators out there and also hundreds of vultures. So here you see, I see all black vultures in this photo here. And I can tell that because once again, I'm looking mostly at their heads because a turkey vulture is gonna have a red head. So if I can see their heads and I see they're black, then I know they're black vultures. Uh, this is a photo from the University of Florida, I think. So I'm not sure where this was taken, but I can look really close. Hard to see right now, but I could tell earlier when I was looking at the photo that some of these are black vultures and some are actually turkey vultures. So they're um, roosting together in this dead tree. All 
right, so let's talk a little bit more about turkey vultures and then we'll do a little comparison of the two of them visually so that if you're out in the field and you're trying to figure out if you're seeing black vultures versus turkey vultures and you're not familiar with how to do that, hopefully some of the upcoming slides will help you with that. So our turkey vultures are also large raptors with long broad wings. They are bigger than most raptors except for eagles and condors. Their wingtips also spread apart like fingers during flight, but they have a much longer tail that extends past their toes when they're flying. And I'll show you a picture of them in flight in a moment. They have a very identifiable flight pattern. They have dihedral shape to their wings, meaning their wings are out in a V shape. So not straight out from their bodies, but actually lifted up at an angle so that if you see them, um, you, you can see, if you see them from the front or the back, they look a little bit like their wings are in a V shape and they wobble, they'll soar on the thermals, but instead of the black vulture, which tends to take sort of long wing beats and then soars, our turkey vultures will soar, but they'll wobble a little bit as they're soaring. And then on the ground, both the black vultures and the turkey vultures walk a little bit like chickens. That's what it looks like to me. They look uh, uncomfortable on the ground and they walk in this wobbly chicken-like way. And then they also will hop on the ground. From a distance, our turkey vultures appear black, but they actually are brown. And then they have a bald red head with a white bill like you're seeing here in this picture. And the undersides of their flight feathers are pale um, all along the entire length of the wing. And that's one of the ways you can differentiate them from black vultures in flight. And once again, I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. Their habitat's gonna be along roadsides and suburbs in fields in the countryside and landfills and construction sites. So mainly anywhere where they're gonna be able to find carrion. They will scrape out nests in rock crevices, on ledges and thickets, hollow logs, fallen trees, or use abandoned nests or buildings. And they will use the same nest for years. So they don't actually build a nest, they scrape one out. Uh, let's see. So like, um, like our black vulture, they are exclusively feeding on dead animal carcasses or carrion as we call it. But unlike the black vulture, they are going to have that excellent sense of smell. And so interestingly, the olfactory part of their brain that processes information about smell is actually larger in turkey vultures than in most other birds. Uh, so their brain is perfectly designed and wired to have an excellent sense of smell. I don't know how that equates with eating carrion, but there you go. It certainly helps them find their food. Uh, so you'll find them soaring at lower altitudes, um, utilizing their sense of smell to find their meals. And you'll find the black vultures often soaring higher above them and keeping an eye on them to lead them to their next meal. So some interesting fun facts, when turkey vultures eat, they often eat one at a time and sort of chase each other away until it's the next vulture's turn. Uh, all vultures provide an essential service in our ecosystem by cleaning out carcasses and decreasing the amount of rotting flesh in our world. And this also therefore decreases the spread of disease. Interestingly, their stomach acid and immune systems are incredibly strong and that allows them to tolerate almost anything without getting sick. Um, here's some really gross fun facts. So when it's hot outside, turkey vultures will defecate on their own feet to cool off. That's a lovely thought. And another lovely thought is that as a defense mechanism, turkey vultures may vomit on a bird, animal, or human that gets too close. So don't get too close to turkey vultures, especially because I can't even imagine how disgusting that would be but it certainly is a very useful defense mechanism. 
All right, so here's a couple pictures for comparison. On your left, you have a turkey vulture. And how we often see these birds is we're down on the ground and they're up above soaring in the sky. And so we see them from underneath. And when the sun hits the underneath of their wings, just so, it's very easy to tell these two birds apart. So our turkey vultures have these light colored undersides to their um, flight feathers all the way from their body to the tips of their primary flight feathers. Yet our black vulture that we see here on the right, only the tips of about the first five primary flight feathers are lighter in color. So when you see them soaring and you, they tip and the sun catches the underneath of their wings, if they just have basically fingertips of light gray, that's going to be your black vulture if they have an entire length of light gray underneath, that's your turkey vulture. And this is actually uh, a layout of their primary flight feathers. And on once again, on your left, you have the turkey vulture, and this is the undersides of their primary flight feathers. So you see how light gray those are um, compared to no, I don't. I don't think I did their upper feathers. So if we were to flip these feathers over, they would be very dark brown. Here's our black vulture, and you can see the first about six primary flight feathers are grayish from the underside, and then they start turning black, which is what this next slide is. These are the flight feathers, the secondary these are actually the secondary wing feathers that are closer to the body on the wing. And you can see on the turkey vulture, those still remain grayish on the underside all the way to the body. Whereas on the black vulture, they are now completely black. So hence, I'm gonna go back once again, here's your primary flight feathers. There's those secondary feathers that are closer to the body on the turkey vulture, completely gray underneath. On the black vulture, only those first five or six primary flight feathers, the ones that spread apart and look like fingertips, are gray underneath. All right, now we are going to talk about our last group of birds in this presentation, and that is the kites that live here in Florida. So there are four species of kites that can be found here in Florida. And we're gonna talk through all four of them and look at a number of pictures of these as well. These are not anywhere near as commonly seen as the vultures and the osprey that we just talked about, which are very common year round here in Florida. Uh, so some of these birds, is at, some of these kites are actually quite rare to see or only here for part of the year. So our Mississippi kite will be the first one we talk about, and that's actually the one that you see the image of here on this slide. So Mississippi kites really are only found in the panhandle of Florida during breeding season. And then uh, there are populations from South Carolina over to Texas, they're only in the Southeast. So from South Carolina to Texas, the populations converge. Um, and travel down to South America outside of breeding season for the winter. So it's unlikely that we're going to see these in the Sarasota area, but they are in Florida, so I wanted to include them. Uh, White-tailed kites, also not likely to be seen in Sarasota County, but they are a non-migratory resident in the tip of South Florida. Our snail kites are non-migratory residents in peninsular Florida, and there is an endangered subspecies of snail kite, which is the one that's here in Florida, and that's called the Everglades snail kite. And then the, my favorite, so I'm going to save it until last, and the, only, the one that is the only one that I'm really familiar with that I see on a regular basis is the swallowtail kite. Uh, these you are going to see in Sarasota County and along the southeastern coast of the U.S. and throughout all of Florida during breeding season. And really, in terms of the United States, the best place to see them is here in Florida from February to September. And then our swallowtailed kites migrate to South America. All right, so let's jump into all four of those kite species and learn a little bit more about them. 
So here's the Mississippi kite. These are smaller sort of pearly gray raptors. They have a slender body. Uh, their wings are long and pointed. Their tail is long and sort of squared off and their bill is deeply hooked because they are a raptor. Uh, they have a mix of gray and black across their body, but their head and secondary flight feathers and chest are pale gray white like we're seeing here. The tail and wingtips are black and juvenile Mississippi kites are streaky with a brown chest, underwings, and banded tail. So these are gonna be found along the Mississippi River. So if you look at a range map, there's like this finger of their range that actually goes further north, right along the Mississippi River, and then more along sort of the coastal and Atlantic parts of um, the Southeast from Texas to South Carolina, including all of Florida. They have different habitats, depending on if they're the Western species, sorry, not a different species, whether they're living in the West in the prairies or if they're living in the East, they prefer old growth forests. And they can also be seen in urban areas. They make a loose shallow cup nest of woven twigs and that is heavily lined with leaves or Spanish moss. And they will use almost any tree species to do that. Although once again, in the East, they prefer some of that old growth. Uh, and they like to be anywhere from a few feet off the ground to more than 115 feet high. So not quite as picky as some of the other birds. They will rebuild and reuse old nests or even use squirrel nests um, to make their nests in. And then they lay one to three eggs. Here's another picture of a Mississippi kite. They're just delicate, elegant looking birds, I think. Uh, they eat medium to large insects. That's the majority of their diet, but they'll also eat small reptiles and small birds. Uh, they are known to be very aggressive towards predators and human intruders during breeding season. So they are very protective of their nests. But then what's interesting is that the nestlings, the young birds, are uncommonly non-aggressive towards each other. So a lot of times in our bird populations, especially our raptors, we will have um, birds that lay the eggs a day to up to even a week apart from each other. And that's a survival adaptation because then the eggs are gonna hatch out at different periods of time and you're gonna have slightly older birds and slightly younger birds in the nest. And if it's a bad year and there's not enough food and um, you know there's just not enough to go around, then generally in a lot of raptor populations like our owls, for instance, the older birds, the older young that are in the nest, will either kill the young birds or just the young birds will not survive because they won't get enough food because those older birds outcompete them. So it's a survival mechanism to make sure on bad years, there's enough food for at least a few of the young to be healthy and survive instead of it being spread so thin that none of the birds survive. Yet for our Mississippi kites, they actually do not show that aggressive nestling behavior and they actually help each other out and they may even stay to help with next year's young like we see in the Florida scrub jays. Uh, Mississippi kites are also known for their graceful acrobatic flight, which is true of pretty much all of our kites. And they will also spend time foraging on the ground and in shallow water. They are social birds and will often roost and hunt in groups of dozens of individuals and will even nest close to each other and other pairs. Here's a white-tailed kite. I'm not going to talk too much about this one. Um, so, but once again, a beautiful bird. This is such a beautiful picture. And these are small to medium-sized raptors, also, also long and slender. I mean, our kites just tend to be more slender, delicate-looking raptors. Their wings are narrow and pointed, and this bird has a long white tail. They have some black patches on the shoulders and they have a pure white head with red eyes. They have a very limited range in the United States. They're found in the grasslands of California and Texas 
and um, also in Southern Florida. They're mostly found in open woodlands, desert grasslands, and marshes of Central South America. So that's where they're more commonly found. They'll eat small mammals, but they'll also eat other birds and lizards. And they will hunt from soaring in the sky, 80 feet above the ground, scanning and looking for their prey, and then diving feet down, wings up like you're seeing in this photo to capture their prey in their talons. And then they do this type of behavior that's known as kiting. They actually turn their body into the wind, gently flap their wings and hover above the ground, sort of like a, when a human flies a kite. So we actually call that kiting. All right, so here is the snail kite. Uh, these are also beautiful birds. They're not quite as slender and elegant as the other kites that we're talking about today. Um, they're also not quite as pale in coloration. They're quite a bit darker and uh, just amazing birds. So they're medium size, they're a little bit bigger. Their wing shape is a little broader and then they have a long broad tail as well. And you see their long thin legs uh, with the orange beak and the orange feet. And of course, they have a distinctively hooked bill because they are raptors, but we're going to talk a little bit more about their bill in just a minute. They are dark gray um, with almost dark grayish brown uh, wings. Uh, the tail is black with a little bit of white and males have a pinkish red skin around the bill while females are browner with whitish feathers around the face. And I have a comparison of the female male and juvenile of this bird coming up on a slide in a minute. Juveniles have more of a buff colored throat and eyebrow and are brown above and streaked below. So these are a year round resident here in the US. This particular subspecies, the Everglades snail kite is a year round resident of South Florida's freshwater wetlands. And then uh, the one that is not the subspecies, that is just a snail kite, is found in the Caribbean and in Central and South America. So what's interesting to me about these birds are they, their diet is almost exclusively apple snails. And so we have a story about the native and invasive apple snail coming up in a minute. But they will dive into open water and catch snails that are in up to six inches deep of water. The other bird locally in Sarasota County and other parts of Florida that eats almost exclusively apple snails is the limpkin. We talked about the limpkin in one of the wading bird presentations. Uh, and both limpkins and snail kites have the same food, the apple snail, but they are able to coexist peacefully and successfully. And this is likely due to their different methods of foraging. So a limpkin is a wading bird. Its bill is also uniquely shaped to be able to eat apple snails, but looks quite different um, from this raptor. Uh, and it is going to be walking around on the ground and in shallow water and searching for those apple snails on, on the ground, whereas our snail kites are going to be diving into water to grab those apple snails. So different ecological niches. So here are some comparisons of the juvenile and our male and our female. So juvenile, male, female. So you can see the male is very slate gray with some darker black wingtips and tail. Um, our female is a little browner and buff colored uh, with some banding. And then our juvenile is also more drab or brownish in coloration with a lot of speckling. And you also see here that pinkish orangish um, skin by the bill of the male, whereas with the female, it's more of a white buff colored with, um, with some featheration there too. Here is an apple snail on your right. And to me, that does look like our native apple snail. And this was just an interesting uh, photograph that we found of a male and a female, probably during mating season there. And you can see um, 
once again, when the male opens up its wings, there is some barring or banding on the undersides of those wings. So here's our, our story of unusual quick evolution of the snail kite because of our introduction of the invasive apple snail. So each of our snail kites eats approximately 10,000 apple snails per year. So that's a lot of apple snails. And this requires about 27 dives per day to capture that amount of food. So we have a Florida native apple snail, the one we saw in the previous picture, and it lives in a very specific freshwater aquatic habitat and has a relatively short lifespan. And over years um, recently, the populations of the native apple snail started to decline, probably secondary to development and decreased water quality, impacting its ability to survive and the amount of habitat for it. So this, because the native apple snail was the main food of the snail kite, this affected and caused um, partially the decline of the snail kite's population as well. And that Everglades snail kite, the subspecies that we find here in Florida, is actually listed as an endangered species. So we had quite a decline of that subspecies, the Everglades snail kite. We are seeing a rebound in the species numbers to some degree because the island apple snail and the channeled apple snail have been introduced um, from other places. For instance, the island apple snail is native to South America. And some of those other species of non-native apple snails have invaded into our Florida wetlands. And an invasive species, the definition of that is a species that was not traditionally or historically found here in this area and was introduced either inadvertently or purposefully by humans. I believe these apple snails were introduced um, mostly due to the aquarium trade. They were selling them to be in aquariums and then of course sometimes they escape. Um, from aquariums or get dumped into waters when people no longer want to keep them. And so that's how these snails got here. And then in order to really be classified as invasive, they also have to be causing damage to the ecosystem. So the invasive apple snails, I'm going to jump ahead and then I'll come back to the story here. The invasive apple snails are quite large. So it's hard to tell between these two pictures, the comparison. So the one up top is our native Florida apple snail. And here is the channeled apple snail. This is the one I believe I tend to find more locally here. And these are huge. As you can see, they can be as big as the palm of your hand, whereas our Florida apple snails are much smaller than that. Um, also, our invasive snails tend to lay way more eggs. So our native apple snail eggs are right here. And you can see, for instance, here's the island apple snail eggs. Um, this one is one called the Titan apple snail, but they tend to lay a lot more eggs and therefore they not only out compete with our native snail by um, utilizing its habitat and eating its food sources, they also out reproduce our native apple snail and some of the invasive apple snails actually eat our native apple snail. So the majority of apple snails I see when I'm out in nature now um, are the invasive apple snail. And usually invasive species are just bad. If they've gotten to the level where we're classifying them as invasive, they really are causing damage to our environment or to our economy by damaging our crops or to human health by carrying diseases. But in this case, there is a, a silver lining to this dark and stormy cloud of apple snails. Um, so because our Everglades snail kite population was declining because its native apple snail population, its food source was declining, when these invasive snails started to really populate our aquatic um, wetlands here in Florida, it provided a new food source for our snail kites. And it's also larger, so it's a bigger meal for our snail kites. So what's really interesting is some research was done and what the researchers found that within less than 10 years 
of the invasive apple snails coming to Florida, the bill size and body mass of the snail kite significantly increased. So usually we don't see evolutionary changes anywhere near that quickly, but we have in this particular case, and the larger bills have become a better tool to extract the meat from the larger snail shells. And this is helping to maintain our snail kite populations. We still wanna see those populations improve and rebound um, because this is still an endangered species, but we are actually seeing them stabilize a little bit because of this food source. And my, in my personal experience with Limpkin populations here in Sarasota County, I feel, I don't have any data to support this, but I feel from personal observation that we also have many more Limpkins than we had uh, when I first came here 20, 25 years ago. All right, so we're down to the last one of the day and one of my absolute favorite birds, the swallowtail kite. Uh, I, I don't know why this is one of my favorite birds. I really think it's just so beautiful. Uh, they're just lovely birds and I am always just so pleasantly surprised and excited when I see that first swallowtail kite of the season, which for me is usually somewhere in the end of March, or sorry, the end of February, early March is when I usually see my first one. So these are large birds, but they're very slim and elegant, like the first two kites we talked about. They have long, narrow wings, and then they have a very identifiable tail. It's really long and deeply forked. And you can't really see it here well because this snail kite is, um, is preening itself and it's got its wing feathers all out too, but we're gonna see a picture in a second where you'll really get to see that just iconic tail, that forked tail of our swallowtail kite. So there is no other bird that you're likely to see here in Florida that is this large with such a forked tail. It also has a clear black and white contrast to its coloration. So once you see one, they're really obviously identifiable. Um, they have a small head and bill, and of course their bill is sharp and hooked. And um, from underneath, you see the white wing lining that is outlined by black flight feathers. And I think I have a picture of that coming up. So these kites acrobatically fly over swamps, marshes, and large rivers along the southeastern coastal United States but they are more commonly found in the U.S. here in Florida. So you can see them, you know, sort of like from South Carolina to Texas along the Gulf Coast and the Southern Atlantic Coast, but um, they're more commonly going to be seen in Florida. They arrive in Florida for breeding season in February or early March, and then they migrate to South America for the winter and are all gone usually sometime in September. So you have to wait a couple more months to see these uh, here in Florida, but they're just absolutely beautiful when you do see them. And they make stick nests lined with moss and lichen in tall trees. They like to nest in pines over 60 feet tall um, and they will lay one to three eggs. Uh, so their diet is uh, mostly insects as we saw in the video. And here we're also seeing just this beautiful underside of this bird. So that stark contrast of white against black, here's that really long forked tail um, and that very delicate head and beak here. So they will also eat other small things like frogs, snakes, lizards, and even young birds and even some small vertebrates, like some small mammals during breeding season, uh, but it's mostly gonna be insects or maybe a frog, snake, or lizard. So some fun facts about our swallowtailed kite. They spend most of their time in flight like many of our other kites do. They catch flying insects and swallow them while in flight and rarely flapping their wings. They can be seen rolling and diving through the air and they really use that tail to uh, maneuver and uh, you can just see them doing all sorts of acrobatics in flight. 
And another interesting fun fact is that they will bring an entire wasp nest back to the nest and they'll eat the adult wasps as well as the larva. And then they will even incorporate the wasp nest into their own nest. And I think in the video, we saw a couple, what looked like either wasps or bees being brought to the nest. Interestingly, their stomach lining is adapted. It's a little bit like spongier and thicker than the average bird's stomach lining. So they're adapted to be able to eat some of those stinging insects. So one last look at this beautiful bird before we finish up with our last few slides. Super excited to see them come back in February or March. So uh, I include this in some of my raptor presentations. So I'm not gonna go through all this because it's mostly relevant to hawks, but some of the birds we talked about today, a couple of the kites can be relatively aggressive if you get near their nest during breeding season, although generally the kites don't like to really nest near humans. But um, if you have any concerns with living near raptors or uh, raptors protecting their nests, then there are some easy things that the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission recommends, and I'm not going to go through all of them. They're here on your slide, but you also can go to myfwc.com, and they have a pamphlet called Living with Raptors that talks about some of these things that you can do to help minimize any type of interaction with some of our raptors if they are nesting near you or a place that you go to often. Um, just a reminder that all birds, other than some of our game birds, so all the birds we talked about today, all of our raptors are protected federally under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and under Florida state law as well. So the birds, their nests, and their eggs are protected and cannot be removed or harassed or uh, anything like that without a permit. You cannot have um, nests or eggs or feathers without some type of scientific or educational permit. So please use your eyes. Uh, to look at feathers on the ground, take a picture if you want to bring them home and identify them. Uh, I don't think I mentioned this, so let me just mention it before I talk about our local Audubon societies. The pictures of the feathers that I shared with you all today, they are from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Feather Atlas. And so that's a great tool to use. If you see a feather on the ground, you're really interested in who it belongs to, take a picture of it since you are not supposed to have that feather unless you have a permit. So take a picture of it, go home, bring up the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Feather Atlas, and you can search through that to see pictures of the primary feathers, the secondary wing feathers, often they'll have the tail feathers. So you'll really get to start learning um, your bird feathers, which also aids in just your overall bird identification. Here are some great places to visit, to learn more about birds and to do some birding. The Sarasota Audubon Society here in Sarasota County is located up by our county park called Celery Fields. The celery fields is an old celery field, an old agricultural field that has been uh, mitigated and now is utilized for stormwater retention, decreased flooding. But those stormwater ponds have been plant, planted with native plants and now upwards of 247 species of birds have been seen at the celery field. So it's a great place to go to look for birds. They often have um, Audubon uh, birders out giving, um, giving some identification and talking about the birds that are seen that day on the boardwalks there. You also can go to the Venice Area Audubon Society and they have a rookery, which is a small stormwater pond with an island in the middle where birds will come and roost at night and also make nests and breed during breeding season. So you can see egrets and herons and cormorants and anhingas and all sorts of our wading birds at the Venice Area Audubon Rookery. 
So if you want to learn more about our local wildlife here in Sarasota County and throughout Florida, or you want to watch any of my webinars that have been recorded and um, put up on YouTube on demand, you can go to our Florida Wildlife webpage and everything is listed there. All of the webinars, all of the resources like to University of Florida and FWC that I talk about in my presentations, the Cornell Lab, all about birds website, which is where I get a lot of the information for these birding webinars. Um, all of those links are on my Florida Wildlife webpage. Here are some of the resources that we use for today's presentation. And I wanna thank you all for joining me today. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. My email is there on your screen and I'm happy to answer any questions or try to identify any pictures that you send me of wildlife related um, signs or actual animals or birds.